two, one. Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. The wonderful thing about life is that it even exists at all. And despite all the drama and the trauma that being alive can inflict upon a fleshy thinking human, we humans press on, inventing ways to prevent diseases, discovering paths to improve our immunity, and giving everything we have to preserve that single most important thing without which the entire span of our existence would remain meaningless. The moment we realize that it's time once again for This Week in Science, coming up next. Kirsten and Blair. Good science to you, Justin. How's it going there in your uh, world of darkness? <laughs> Having a happy Thursday over here. <laughs> you illuminated by the light of science there? Always, 24 7. It's fantastic. Well, this is This Week in Science, everyone, and we do hope that you are illuminated by the light and the wonders of science and that our little show once a week can kind of help make your world that much brighter. Right, Blair? Exactly. Exactly. Right. So, so Science is power. Knowledge is power. <laughs> power to the people, man. Yay. Exactly. So let's dive into the show. I have a bunch of space news. I also have uh, some, I'm, I'm, I think I'm t kind of taking one of Blair's stories here. It's a story about semen. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> and <laughs> and what forward is to our it. Navy up to these days anyway? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and I you know, additionally have a little bit of uh, curiosity. What do you have, Justin? Hmm. Hmm. I have I have too many stories. I've got I was there was some I was settled on that I was gonna I've got brains, I've got uh, mice, stressed out mice. It's kind of an epigenetic thing. Uh, I have ooh, ooh intergalactic smoothie. Ooh, an intergalactic smoothie. Intergalactic smoothie. Mm -hmm. uh, ooh, bad news for nanotubes. And. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, sure. I wish they'd figured this one out. Carbon di dioxide levels in kids in classrooms. Ew. Something you never think about, but it uh, makes too much sense. And uh, self-awareness in humans might be a complicated issue. Hmm, interesting. Might be, could be. <laughs> right? Possibly. Yeah, Possibly. Self-awareness. Eh, it might be a little complicated. So, yeah, no, I'm, I find it quite a simple thing to be self-aware myself. Yeah. But anyway, Blair, what'd you bring? Um, I brought a story about gibbons, type of ape, not a monkey, uh, and <laughs> a monkey. Um, what we've learned from putting them in a room full of helium. Wow, really? Yes. Gibbons in helium. <laughs> this is yeah. the way the world Besides needs. Besides just that they sound amazing. <laughs> Doesn't everything sound yes. amazing in yes. helium? Yes. I mean, I should have brought some now for the for the story. I should have brought some. Hey, gonna, hey, like I should have done the story like in my helium voice. That would have been exactly. appropriate. It would have oh. been. It would have been. Hindsight is twenty twenty. Helium balloons for all of us folks missed here. Missed opportunity. <gasps> oh, <laughs> no missed opportunities. Uh, so let's get started. I have, uh, let's, I wanted to start off the show with, with space news. So some interesting news is, uh, coming out of Berkeley, California this week. Some, uh, there's been the sighting of a couple of supernovas. And I think this is something that we've reported on before, uh, but this is uh, the first time it's been published in a, uh, a peer-reviewed journal. And so it was, uh, it was published in um, Nature. I, nope, sorry, Science. The other one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. one of the two. It's published in Science this last week, and it was uh, 
a, a lot of Berkeley lab researchers were a part of it, but it was a multi-institutional team. So Palomar Transient Factory is the name of the team. And they've been looking at these uh, type 1A supernova progenitors. And one of the biggest questions about type 1A supernovas is where do they come from? How do they get started? And there have been a few ideas about how the stars that ignite supernovas, how they get big enough to reach the threshold that leads to um, something as big as a supernova. And uh, in this particular in this particular observation, they ended up seeing a couple of different supernovas and that they came from different starting points. They look exactly the same when they actually go supernova. So the type 1A supernova is pretty, pretty consistent and constant across the board, but um, they come, they, they have different starting points. And so, uh, these direct observations that they have of this system called PTF-11KX, very sexy name there, Palomar Transient Factory 11KX, had a red giant star. And they show that the system underwent at least one much smaller supernova uh, eruption, or a nova eruption before it became a supernova. And in this, this system is some great distance away. And then there is a different system that was observed indirectly and they have no evidence of a red giant star. So one system with a red giant, one system without. And how is this, how is it coming about this way? So how, how do they look so similar if they have these different starting points? Um, so it's a pretty, it's, it's a pretty interesting paper and the, the fact that they're getting a lot more information about how supernovas get, get started um, is going to tell us a lot more about how we uh, calibrate for different things around the universe. Um, so the, uh, there can be stars undergoing multiple nova eruptions, not only just one massive eruption, but it, there can be lots and lots and maybe small bursts that lead to supernovas ev eventually, but it has to do uh, with, it, it has to do with how big the star can get and how much material is blown off of a star. Um, and so there's this idea that a, the red giant star can blow dust and material off of itself and that can land on a local white dwarf and then that can cause, because it's material landing on the white dwarf, that can lead the white dwarf to nova. Mm -hmm. And so when they're looking at the system, they could possibly see uh, this white, the nova, and then the eventual supernova when uh, the, the red giant goes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Huh. Anyway, there's, yeah, there's some, there's some interesting stuff there. Um, just interest, interesting in the sense of what are we looking at out there? What are the things in our in our universe? Um, and then, in, along the lines of what else are we looking at out there, a group of researchers um, were making use of the Gamma Survey, the Galaxy and Mass Assembly Survey, looking at a, a 3D map of local uh, the local universe what's around us. Uh, they were using it to identify local galaxies and they found 14 galaxies uh, similar to the Milky Way and they're also accompan accompanied by dwarf galaxies similar to the large and small Magellanic clouds. And um, they found that of the 14 there are two that are almost an exact match for our own Milky Way. So we've never before seen anything that matches our galaxy system. I mean, not that we've looked all over the place to know that there would be something else that, out there that would match it, but in this very small survey that they've done, they came up with two that match our galaxy. And so if we have two that match our galaxy, immediately you think of, well, if there's, there are a couple of galaxies that are very similar to our own, does that mean they have the possibility of a planet like Earth at some point within them. 
At least yeah, that's where my head goes. It's interesting. Well, it's interesting too because you know it, it totally makes sense that there, because there's so many billions of galaxies that you know on, on some sort of cosmic scale there could be other galaxies that resemble the Milky Way. What's really interesting is how much variety there is in galaxies themselves and how different our neighborhood of galaxies are. Like we don't have there aren't a, there isn't a galaxy anywhere around us that's like the Milky Way. We're a, we're like a freak show over here, <laughs> and, and it's nice to know. It's like Ooh, okay, look, yeah, we're not just a big like, cosmic dust cloud like a lot of galaxies, kind of. Uh, but we're not alone. We have there's others like us out there. Yeah, cool. mm -hmm. I think it's kind of cool. So anyway, I, taking a look at the universe tells us uh, all sorts of new stuff every time. So, uh, Justin, tell me a story. All right, this is a this is a story that uh, it's out of Boston, I think. Uh, Tufts University School of Medicine study in mice conducted by researchers at Tufts University suggests that women a woman's risk of anxiety and dysfunctional social behavior may depend on the experiences of her parents, particularly her father's, hmm. and and even more so when they were young. Study published online in Biological Psychiatry suggests that stress caused by chronic social instability during youth contributes to epigenetic changes in sperm cells that lead to psychiatric disorders in female offspring across multiple generations. Wow. See now, like, this is, this is even un unintuitive from the whole epigenetic sort of thing, but wow. So, wait, across multiple generations? So if so, basically, if I was if I, I went through all kinds of chronic social instability during my youth, yeah. <laughs> Lord knows, <laughs> <laughs> my daughter and her her daughter, I'm supposing, could have adverse psychological effects as a result of it. Hmm. They could they could be more prone to anxiety. Interesting. That is very interesting. I'm sorry, my sweet. My sweet <laughs> I know. Here. Does does it make you think of your daughter? <laughs> yeah. Although I don't know. I mean, there was chronic stress and instability around me, but I think I was kind of like, eh. so as long as I was like not stressed out by it, I think I think she'll be fine. Long term effects of stress can be pernicious. <laughs> Who uses that word? Pernicious. Uh, pernicious. It's pernicious, pernicious stress. We first found that the uh, adolescent mice exposed to chronic social instability, where the cage composition of mice is constantly changing, exhibited anxious behavior and poor social interactions throughout their adulthood. These changes were especially prominent in the female mice, said the author Lorena Savadura Rodriguez, PhD. So this is a uh, yeah. Now we this is uh, the more that we've been learning about these about epigenetics, the more interesting it is. It's it's sort of. It, the real impact of epigenetics seems to take place when we are first getting the hormones to reproduce. So young males' experiences affects the sperm production forever. Uh, when and, and in women, in egg production, it would sort of be the time. The things that are stressing out or, or affecting a young woman uh, take place, and it follows. It follows our reproductive path through the next generation. No one beyond that. Yeah. Well, what's what's interesting about uh, about this idea is that so when you think about sperm are constantly being produced, so you have this constant um, just constant production. They're just moving out in a constant flow. Whereas with eggs, as far as we know, we take a break know, once in a while. <laughs> they take a break. Okay. Not not so much, but uh, <laughs> it's a pretty constant for event in a male's life consistent and in a for women as far as we know right. um, all of your eggs are produced when you're very young yep. so even Here's while your you're allotment, that's all you get <laughs> yeah so even while you're in the womb developing yep. that's when your eggs are are being developed and there there is there are effects for on them for sure around puberty but if you think about stress and how acute stress would affect something. 
-hmm. acute stress would probably be more likely to f affect the sperm production because mm -hmm. that's something that's the right. sperm coming out. I, I don't know. Next, I want to see what all these other lifestyle things, how they affect sperm because, you know, women can't aren't supposed to smoke or drink or even drink a lot of coffee when yeah. they're pregnant but now I'm wondering you know is every time you binge drink is then you know is the sperm that you produce after that are they not quite right <laughs> you know, it makes them stronger <laughs> right swimmers. yeah yeah that's one It'd be idea. interesting to see what you know obviously I'm kind of joking about that that's yeah. probably not a big deal but there's other things if if it's anxiety or stress could affect um, the quality of your sperm in one way or another. I'm sure there's other things out there that could potentially have an effect. And that's that's like a whole area that we probably haven't really looked into very much. Not as much as, yeah. We, yeah. I mean, you people just are assume, looking ah, into sperm it. Sperm is sperm. It's fine. <laughs> it's all good. Yeah, there's so much of it. <laughs> yeah, but the, did you did you uh, bring the... Uh, <laughs> For everyone. <laughs> <laughs> did, you, did you bring the story, Justin? There's the one this week uh, that... Um, Older men having babies might be related to the uh, in increased incidence of autism and schizophrenia. Ooh. Yeah, that's a, that's been a, that's been around for a while. Yeah, but that that's been an idea for a while. But there was a something just out in the New York Times and some other uh, I don't remember which journal it was published in, but I, I saw a report on it in the New York Times um, saying that there's much stronger evidence. Now, now a times. Yeah. Father's age linked to risk of autism and schizophrenia. Yes. Yeah. So older dads, yeah, maybe your sperm are getting a little tired. That, that's quite a graph, too, if you go to this. <laughs> that's, that's, yeah. When's, it, when's the big drop-off happen? About what age? Mm -hmm. How long do I have to make more children? Let's see. I'm trying to see in here. And what's the upside? Do I do I do I, I mean is it a higher risk of that and and a better chance of creating a genius child? <laughs> the overall <laughs> risk to a man in his forties or older is in the range of two percent. Oh, that's nothing. Oh pff. I don't take that much. <laughs> so let's see if we can open this graphic up to a little uh a little screen sharing here. Yeah, two percent is not a lot, but it's it's a I significant. Mean, but it's difference. something. It's yeah, something. it's more than zero. <laughs> yeah. See, but that's so. In fact, they only looked at autism and schizophrenia. How about high IQs? Is that that's probably mm. up that goes up too. <laughs> <laughs> there are probably a lot of a lot of factors involved, but according to this New York Times graph. Researchers analyzed genetic material from 78 Icelandic children and their parents, including 44 children with autism spectrum disorder. Children of older fathers tended to have a higher number of mutations that are not inherited from either parent. Hmm. Um, this is interesting, too. They said that um, these kinds of mutations that they're saying are account uh, accounted for by the, the father being older account for 20 to 30 percent of autism cases. Hmm. So... If you think but, about that, that's actually that's pretty impactful. That twenty to thirty percent of autism cases come from older fathers. Okay, okay, but here let me let me take it back. Just just perhaps eh, be completely wrong. But is there a chance that because to there it's genetically linked from the parents? We know this from from most autism. Is it possible that those high functioning, uh, uh, you know, spectrum autism who will become doctors and information handlers of some nature, engineers or whatever, their social skills are such that they don't begin to reproduce until <laughs> they're in their 40s? <laughs> it's like maybe it took them a long time to meet the right somebody. And that's why I'm thinking maybe like 40 year old virgins. And then they have kids, but it was already they already had the gene that could lead to autism prevalent in the DNA. Is that that's probably wrong? But I I'm going to think idea. that because it makes me sleep better at night. Yeah, well, the I mean, what this what this this all suggests though is it's not a gene for autism that's specifically uh, that's specifically in the father or the mother's 
chromosomes, that this is a mutation that occurs in the sex cells, the sperm, as a result of aging. That as something is not quite right or something deteriorates in the sperm, <coughs> the man gets older. But anyway... Moving on, you're watching This Week in Science, we're talking about, hey, what's this? Science! Blair, did you want to chat about some uh, animals? Yeah, let's do it! All right. Blair's Animal Corner with Blair! She works at a zoo, likes hippos, isn't fond of panda. Yep. All true. <laughs> <laughs> I like how that's just defined my existence now. Mm -hmm. Likes just... hippos! Dislikes pandas. See, this just making me sound like a bad animal person, <laughs> but I just can't deny it is the problem. Okay, also anyway. Anyway, I just, I just keep wanting to add things to the yeah. list. Like, eventually it's just going to be this introduction that's five minutes long, <laughs> like a new thing every that's week. That's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, it's not that I dislike pandas. It's just that I like other animals more. They are very much at the bottom of my list. That's the situation, <laughs> I have to say. Okay. All right. Anyway, gibbets. <laughs> Those of you who don't know what a gibbon is, um, the one of the very famous kinds of gibbons is called a siamang. That's a type of gibbon. We have also have uh, white-faced gibbons, white-handed gibbons, but they're these smaller um, apes that have huge, crazy long arms and are fam famous for their their being the perfect example of brachiation. That's where they they swing from those giant arms back and forth, mm -hmm. and uh, these guys in Japan, some researchers have been looking at lar gibbons, also known as white-handed gibbons, and their amazing vocal abilities. And so if you've, if you've never heard a siamang or a gibbon call before, it is amazingly loud and rhythmic, and it's, I think it's very uh, beautiful and charming. And it's funny, I actually can hear the siamangs at my house. I'm a good five, six wow. blocks from the zoo, and I can hear them in my house when I'm with the windows closed. So are so they the, like, are they like, how does, how does a given sound? Give us a good given. Well, question. so I put in the show notes, there's a, a normal white-handed given sound. So you guys no, can no, hear no, that. No, 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 they're pretty much, I want to hear No, no, this I'm not doing it. Don't we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna hear. Are they this one? Are they this one? Yep, yep, that's them. <laughs> Mm -hmm. There we go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's There's that's a white-handed gibbon. The siamangs are, are a little bit lower voiced, um, and they do the make that sound doing. you were making. Um, yeah, that's that's more of a siamang. So um, siamangs are, are famous for these crazy loud, varying calls, and and so the the scientists in Japan wanted to look specifically at the way that they can do that. And, you know, the headline was that by putting them in with helium, they pretty much found that these, I almost said monkeys, apes. <laughs> bad. Very good. Okay. Good. These apes, it's like square one for me. All right. These apes um, essentially have the vocal abilities that we previously have restricted to opera singers, specifically soprano opera singers. And... The, they put them in a chamber with a, with a high amount of helium in them, <clears throat> in the chamber. And when we take in helium, the reason it makes our voice higher is it changes the resonance frequency of our vocal tract. <laughs> and that's what makes <laughs> us sound like we're speaking higher. And what opera singers do, soprano opera singers do, that makes them so effective in projecting and having such good tonality and being able to have the vibrato in their voice and all of that has to do with m matching the resonance frequency of the sound that they're making with the resonance frequency of their vocal tract. Mm -hmm. And that's what makes it so powerful. So we had previously thought humans were the only ones that could do that. But by looking at the these gibbons and listening to their call normally and then putting them in a helium chamber and then them calling in there, they changed the frequency 
that their voice was at to match the new resonance frequency of their vocal tract. Huh. huh. Yeah. Wait, so yeah. so they so they changed the way that they performed yes. the vocalization right. to match. Yes. So did it then sound the same? Would that well, would, does that mean that the, that the same sound comes out? Well, I'll let you be the judge of that. If you want to play it, it's in the the article. It is in the article. Yeah, if you scroll down, I yeah, just, on the yeah. Do I just pr yes. press that? Yes. So it sounds different. Have vocal folds very similar. Okay. Yeah. It sounds a little different. It's subtle. It's very subtle. But they yeah, but they were able to Yeah, they were able to adjust <laughs> it so they could still project in the same way. Which That's I guess really is something neat. yeah that we had thought only humans could do. Hmm. Now here's my beef with this. <laughs> so the question is why should humans only be able to do this? Exactly. Because they had thought that humans had evolved to be able to sing, basically, was what they were saying. That that was the scientific wisdom previously. But I take issue with that. Why would we evolve to sing? I, exactly. <laughs> What is the point of that? <laughs> Plus, these animals, they're in a rainforest. The rainforest is the loudest habitat of any habitat on the planet by multiple factors. It is so loud there that all the animals that live in the rainforest have to find ways to communicate with each other and get over this din. And that makes it then even louder that there's all yeah. these animal sounds. Yeah. And so why wouldn't animals have figured out how to do this with their voice why would suddenly humans have an opera gene out of nowhere it seems it makes so much more sense to me that it would have come before us yeah yeah that's, that's why that, this article I was, that we, I was a little that our ability to sing is a result of yeah. adaptations yeah. that took place way before we ever right. hit the scene Right. Yes. Yeah. That's why I kind of, I took issue. I was a little perturbed by the way that they talked about it in this article. Justin, are you, uh, are you going to argue this point? You sounded like you're like, well, um, da, um, da, um, da, over there. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, it's, it's one of those things that I think that once, once the value and the ability to communicate, I, I would think that almost the ability to communicate with language of some sort, um, the cognitive ability would come first in that after generations of training the human voice, I don't know, that's sort of how I would see it happening. It would sort of be epigenetic changes or preferential, just use of our vocal cords in a different way that sort of would change things. Because it, having the voice that allows you to communicate and then happening to have a brain that also allows you to make use of that, those vocal cords, just, I don't know. I don't quite buy it that direction. I think you have the cognitive ability first and are trying to use more and varied sounds with your vocal cords with which to communicate. That makes sense to me. Right. Well, what they're saying is that there's a lot of uh, stuff involved with this that is strictly genetic. That mm -hmm. it's, it's not just if you don't have the, the genes for this, it's not going to happen for you, but ultimately this is a genetic factor that this isn't something that just anyone could wake up I can't say I'm gonna be an opera singer and right. no, even if I trained for 30 years I'm not gonna be an opera singer because I don't have the vocal cords I wasn't I didn't have the genetic code that was then turned into the vocal cords that would give me an opera singers voice I just don't have it some people got it yeah some people don't yeah and I mean singing is is in a lot of ways, yes, we feel like it's part of our culture and communication, but all animals sing. <laughs> I feel like yeah. any any yeah. animal communication, you could somehow turn into something you could maybe call a song. I mean, the hyraxes we talked about a yeah. few months ago, that's a song. Birds sing. Mm -hmm. Monkeys sing. I don't know. I feel like this is very <laughs> an anthro... Uh, Anthrocentric. Anthrocentric, I would yeah. yeah. I would agree with you there. <laughs> but I, I did think agree. it was cool that they, they put the gibbons into helium to figure that out. That was, <laughs> I love that. That was pretty how awesome. How can we find out how yeah. this works? Oh, 
what is which, by the way, which is hard to come by. There's a helium shortage going on uh, nationwide or globally. Globally. Oh. We need more nuclear. Maybe Major. Japan is, is keeping all of the helium for their given project, <laughs> projects. That's why. <laughs> they, they must have had that stored away, though, because that stuff is high, yeah. the, the car dealerships. Every Saturday and Sunday would fill up balloons, oh, uh, and they'd be flying everywhere. Go drive by one this uh, this weekend, even this coming in the, the next weekend, the holiday weekend. There won't be any balloons. They've been cut <laughs> no. off. They've been no cut off. balloons. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I look forward to hearing about um, other animals being put in helium chambers now, because isn't that the next step? Is we assumed humans were the only ones. Now, oh, Gibbons can do it, Look, too. Another ape. Now it's time to keep yeah. looking. And then once we've looked at all the apes, maybe we need to take a step down the evolutionary Let's ladder. down? How about just well, next to? Next to? Over. Well, how about some birds? Yeah. I put myself above a bird, birds. evolutionarily. I mean, yeah. the timeline well, may be the same. Well, I no. Think, I think no. us hairless apes got more done with our time. <laughs> Well, I just meant like we could look at lemurs, right? Because right. lemurs obviously are from um, a more uh, primitive, primitive is the wrong group. word, but you know, mm -hmm. yeah, it's from a lower a, a lower word. fork is where they broke off. So we we could look at them at the prosimians, and you know, I don't know, a more primitive branch. Take a stepwise so approach. To this. Just keep sticking animals into the helium. See what happens. Fair. I just want to keep that big room of helium and step into it occasionally. Yeah. It would be fun. I'm sure the scientists did that. They must have. Yeah, you don't want to stay in a room full of helium yeah. too long because actually it's not very good for you to yeah. breathe only helium. Since right, you'll pass out. Yeah, <laughs> since we need the Kill oxygen. Kill some brain cells. Yeah, we need the oxygen. Okay. So anyway, not the best idea for longevity. Um, but I just wanted to give a one more quick story before we go to the break. Um... Since, you know, we're on the subject of animals and their songs, which we all know have have to do with romance, right? Let's take yep. it let's take it from the bridge to the chorus. We're gonna be we're gonna talk about semen. We're going to talk Yay. about reproduction and sex. We were talking a little bit about how the mutations in old men's semen might lead to autism in their children earlier, but for some animals, there is an ingredient in the seminal fluid, the fluid that bathes the semen, that carries them along um, in their journey. The seminal fluid has an ingredient in it that can cause ovulation, that can stimulate ovulation in females. So procreate, you, the, the animals try, will consummate the ejaculation will lead to ovulation and increase the likelihood of, uh, of reproduction. That makes so, perfect sense. Yeah. So years ago, like in the, in the 80s, um, researchers in Japan, no, in, uh, in China, actually, and researchers in China suggested that there might be some kind of factor in semen for some animals that triggers ovulation and they called it OIF an ov ovulation inducing factor now about the same time you know within a few years um, researchers looking at, uh, at other um, proteins in semen found that there's a protein called nerve growth factor in bull semen now nerve growth factor if you're into the neurosciences you understand that this is a factor that induces nerve growth. It's related to, um, to growth and development of the brain. It's related to all sorts of really, uh, really important things having to do with your nerves. And the question is, what on earth was nerve growth factor doing in bull semen? Mm. Nobody had an answer for it, and it's just kind of this search for um, OIF, the ovulation-inducing factor, kind of took over. And so we have the, the search for this factor, and now researchers in, uh, uh, where is it, University of Saskatchewan in Saskatoon, Canada, have discovered that OIF is indeed NGF. Ovulation, this ovulation-inducing factor 
is nerve growth factor. And this, uh, they have characterized the protein and found that they are one in the same. And so um, this NGF is kind of interesting that this nerve growth factor leads to ovulation. And so how is this possibly doing this? One researcher not related to this study, um, but who studies uh, neuroproteins, neurotrophins that include NGF, says that this new study indicates that NGF in male sperm can travel through the female's bloodstream to the brain to act on the hypothalamus and pituitary gland to release the required proteins for pregnancy. So they don't actually have the evidence that this is really what indeed happens, but this is what it indicates might happen. So there could be the NGF somehow getting into the bloodstream huh. from the reproductive system um, and traveling up to the brain. I find that hard to wow. hard to believe, but I don't know. <laughs> wow, that yeah. is totally wild. Yeah. Huh. <laughs> so it's it's just it's an interesting um, interesting little tidbit of information and in humans uh, this this is not the way it works. We don't have this ovulation induce inducing factor. Um, but there are other uh, other animals that uh, in which it's not necessarily ovulation inducing, but it does affect factors related to reproduction and their and the female's um, likelihood to conceive. And so there are, if it's not specifically causing ovulation, the NGF in the semen it has been found in human semen as well mm -hmm. um, it is having some kind of an effect but we don't know exactly what it is yet which I think that's gonna be the, the interesting next question to go after yeah does it make women smarter <laughs> Right. because that that would be that would be a great pitch and no strike it was a little bit low I can help you with that <laughs> oh dear <laughs> Oh dear. And on that note, <laughs> I think it's about time that we take it to the break. This is This Week in Science, and we'll be back in just a few moments with more science news. What song do we want to listen to right now? All right, everyone, this episode of This Week in Science has been brought to you by Audible. Audible is the leading provider of audiobooks with over 100,000 audiobooks in their li library. And they are offering you a free audiobook download just for signing up. Just try them out. See if you haven't tried it out before, just give them a try. All you have to do is start a free trial and they'll let you download a book for free. Go to audiblepodcast.com slash twists right now. That's audiblepodcast.com slash twist right now. Get a free audio book download. And Twist also has merchandise that you might enjoy, so head on over to twist.org and check out what we have to offer. We have CDs, we also have t-shirts, and I know that some of you like wearing shirts, some of you like listening to music, and if you haven't actually tried ours it's really not that big of a financial investment to be able to do it our two, 2010 music CD is available it's um, we are starting to run low on our supplies but it is still available and we also have our world robot domination t-shirts very green very world robot domination -y. you'll enjoy them I know it um, additionally, TWIS is supported by the donations of listeners like you, and your donations lead to the support of our infrastructure, 
our ability to host our shows, to be able to uh, to get have the bandwidth we need to do the shows, to um, even do fun things occasionally. And um, your donations, we've tried to make uh, the process very easy for you by putting donate buttons all over our website. So if you go to twist.org, there's our PayPal buttons. We do accept donations via PayPal currently. Uh, there are PayPal buttons available along the right the right side and additionally on each episode page so you can go to the most recent episode listen to the episode check out the show notes that Blair has so lovingly handcrafted for you and then scroll on down to the bottom where you can make comments or not join the community make some comments but there are great pink donation buttons that you can click on and easily donate via PayPal. We really, really couldn't do this without you. Thank you for your support. And now, back to the music. Maybe I'll try another one. <laughs> When I was a young child, maybe four or five. And we're back with more This Week in Science. That's right. Justin, do you have more science? Yeah, I do. And actually, this is, uh, this is kind of going off the theme of the room full of helium. What about a room full of carbon dioxide? How would that affect a group of people? Why would that affect a group of children who are trying Not just desperately Gibbons? to learn? <laughs> no, they've actually they conducted this experiment on children. The, uh, they did it uh, with some 55 million children across the United States over the last 50 years. This is, uh, this is really interesting. This, these re uh, researchers have uh, developed a device that can detect uh, higher levels of carbon dioxide, and they plan on installing one in classrooms. And the idea makes quite a bit of sense. Throughout the day, uh, a, a human being creates about two pounds of carbon dioxide gas just by exhaling, by breathing. You figure you, you get a classroom with 30-some kids, you know, they're, they're in there, all the doors are shut, the windows are shut, then they're doing their breathing for an hour. That's, uh, I don't know, I don't know how to do math, that sounds like a couple pounds of uh, carbon dioxide right there, even with little people. So the idea is, that could it be, could the day at school be causing kids to become drowsy mm -hmm. just from exposure to, to being in these closed classrooms and the carbon dioxide that, that they're <laughs> producing? So yeah, but poor air quality in school classrooms is a growing concern, says Jack Driscoll, Ph.D., who led a team that developed the sensor at his, uh, at his firm. Uh, many school districts are in the midst of budget concerns, budget crunches, and have delayed construction of new facilities. As a result, school classrooms are getting more crowded, with occupancy levels as high as one person for every 40 square feet. The average office worker has about 140 square feet of space, as a uh, comparison. The uh, energy cons conservation is another factor, noting that newer school buildings are more tightly sealed against drafts unless heating and air conditioning systems are constantly ventilating the building properly, stale air gets trapped in the classroom. So, for, in the, for example, in the past, air in the typical school classroom was refreshed four to six times an hour. In the new energy-efficient classrooms of the future of today, there may be only one or two exchanges per hour. Really interesting. So, I think that something I never never considered or never thought about, but the effects of all the breathing in a, in a closed classroom. Yeah, causing, I haven't... Causing, causing children to become slightly more drowsy. <laughs> it makes sense. Yeah, so there's going to... I mean, you're definitely going to be stifling flow from the outside environment, but, I mean, I've always thought of classrooms as kind of drafty places, 
<laughs> at least my classrooms were mm. growing up. <laughs> you went you went to school in like the wild west somewhere. <laughs> Right, well, and and I'm, I'm specifically I can I can recall like I, I do recall like some of the older classrooms, uh, you know the, none of the windows sealed properly. They always had those those high windows that for some reason I don't I don't know why you would invent windows like this, but they, they had to get the long rod with the little mm -hmm, pin at the mm -hmm. end to open and close the little ventilation. And even when they were closed, like air would come wafting through. But I do recall in in high school we had what is now these beautiful new buildings. Uh, but back then was these temporary buildings. They're sort of like little mobile home classrooms, and they were sealed up tight. And we were in they they were low ceiling versus the high ceilings in the regular classrooms. They were much smaller, and we were really packed in there. And I think that's that's why I didn't do good in high school. <laughs> you know, the new wing when I was in high school didn't even have windows in a lot of the classrooms. Wow, that's brutal. I wonder. Mm. Were you always sleepy and yeah. feeling a little dumb? That might have had something to do yeah. with um, the fact that my school days in high school were 7.30 a.m. to 3.30 p.m., though. That's a long day. That might have made me drop. Yeah. That's something else. <laughs> Schools need to work with the biology of the students yeah. so that they can be more effective. I mean, yeah. forcing kids to be up when they really should not be yeah. and they should be getting more sleep. Yeah. So you wonder why I can't speak in French to you right now, French <laughs> professor. <laughs> but it's 740 and my brain doesn't work. <laughs> Identity 4, I love the comment in the chat room. My school was a stuffy brick prison. Yeah, I think I went to that school too. Went through a lot of stuffy yeah. brick mm -hmm. prison schools. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but also in my uh, high school classrooms, they had ended up... Um, cutting, putting fake walls in the middle of these classrooms and sticking what was supposed to be one classroom for 20, 25 kids, making two 35-person classrooms out of that one classroom. Whoa. So I'm sure that helped, too. There's lots of, like, uh, just as I was saying, overcrowding. <laughs> overcrowding. That's a lot of carbon dioxide. <laughs> Plus it's San Francisco, so the windows it's are always meters, closed because it's cold. Yeah, it's about <laughs> the fog. Yeah. Or or in the Central Valley, they're always closed because it's 110 degrees out. You know, it's it, we get the. Yeah, in college, the brand new biology hall, most of the lecture halls didn't have windows either. So this is something that we're learning. Yeah. Designing mm -hmm. the yeah. buildings. Yeah. Hey, you know who already has yeah. it figured out? Yeah. Las Vegas. Yeah. Las Vegas is like pumping they got like pumping oxygen, oxygen in. Yeah. yeah. So I had to keep everybody awake and active. That's and funny, I didn't on. know that. That's that is funny. Yeah. That's, Justin, you're on to something there. Design our classrooms like casinos. Yep. <laughs> uh, right answer. You'll never know what time it is. No <laughs> clocks, right? No, no clocks. You work with short attention spans mm -hmm. and you're making people more alert. Mm -hmm. This is great. Mm -hmm. I think this is perfect. Free well, drinks. No, wait. I, Sorry. I think that you're right the <laughs> oxygen thing. The oxygen, like actually pumping oxygen, oxygen in is a myth. Uh, but they do keep them very well ventilated, so they've got yeah. fresh air constantly pouring in through those places. Um, that part is, is, <sighs> is for real. All right. Let's move on. What's going on? You guys got any ideas, any curiosity out there? Aliens? I, I do, I do. I would like to I'd like to hear a story about Mars. <laughs> well I've got I've got a couple that I wanna I, three stories that I'm just gonna shove together really fast because the Curiosity Lands Lander, the Mars Science Laboratory, is uh, up and running. And as of this last week, the ChemCam has uh, has zapped its first rock, which is very exciting. Um, we have the ChemCam, which we know is a laser instrument uh, that that allows the... Uh, it's a laser with a camera, and the camera has great magnification, and the laser uh, zaps and vaporizes material in such a way that the uh, light that is given off the light that uh, is caught by the camera um, allows it to determine what materials are in the rock and so you get um, according to this article from 
JPL, the Mars Science Laboratory, ChemCam laser excites atoms in the rock to an ionized glowing plasma and light from that spark uh, is captured by a telescope and then analyzed by three spectrometers looking for information about what is in it. And so they zapped their first rock this last week. Uh, ChemCam recorded spectra from the laser-induced spark at each of 30 pulses and they were doing target practice basically and uh, just calibrating the instrument to make sure that they were recording um, the intensity at the right wavelengths and being able to, to see everything but this is a composite image that you can see here uh, showing the magnification of, a, of the rock that was imaged. Additionally, the robot arm on Curiosity is uh, was has been stretched. Curiosity is stretching its muscles, so it's flexing its robotic arm. Um, seven foot long arm for those of you who like the metric system. Two point one meters long. This arm uh, has a turret of tools, according to JPL, including a camera, a drill, a spectrometer, a scoop, and mechanisms for sieving and portioning samples of powdered rock and soil. Um, and it worked just as we planned, says JPL's Louise Jandura. From telemetry and from the images received this morning, we can confirm that the arm went to the positions that we commanded it to go to, which is very exciting as well. And then uh, also the rover, which in its name rover, you would expect it to be roving. It is finally mobile. And so... Uh, there is a 360 degree panorama that's available uh, where you can see rovers tracks um, in uh, in the background in the dirt uh, that the rover made from moving around going forward 15 feet rotating 120 degrees and reversing eight feet um, there's also some really uh, there's also some uh, great information showing uh, laser plasmas. There's some just just fun stuff that we're getting. Ken cams, chemicals from the uh, laser spectra. The plot lines show emissions from different elements that are present, and they're starting to get some really great information on what is there. Calcium, silicon, iron, uh, aluminum, calcium. A lot of calcium. Very interesting. Also, uh, we have this. We have rock zapping rocks exposed by the sky cranes thrusters, the scour marks in the soil. Uh, there are also images taken uh, before and after the chem cam laser shots. We have um, overhead views from the rover's arm taking taking images. There's some great pictures. Great pictures that are coming back from. Mars. Mars is a, a wondrous place and we're lucky we get to have this, uh, this, this eye on the planet. Cool. Yeah. Is so that, he did his calisthenics and now he's ready to go. Now he's ready to go. <laughs> exactly. And um, do you remember the guy with the, uh, the, the Mohawk, Bobek, the Mohawk and the stars? Did you, did you watch the live landing? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So there's there's this guy, Bobek, who he everybody loves Bobek. Like he has he has the the mohawk and he's got the he had stars in the side of his <laughs> hair, shaved into the side of his hair. And he became like an instant instant celebrity. Of course. <laughs> but you know, of the excitement that he was showing while uh um while the landing was happening, but now they have him uh giving JPL's Mars Curiosity mission updates and so if you go to YouTube or to JPL's website they have um, there are videos and Bobek is he tells the story of, of yeah. Curiosity and he does a great job I think that's also very fun that's awesome we have a new science communicator yay <laughs> let's make science cool with mohawks and stars and stars mm -hmm. that's, yeah. that's probably the right way to <laughs> and, and just a quick correction Blair science is already cool we're trying to make people cool right okay make it um, media savvy Media, we're we're media trying to make ready. people cooler by getting them informed about it. Right. You can be cooler by knowing more about science. Oh, and I think also within the last week they finalized that the landing place where the where the lander 
touchdown is now called Bradbury Landing after the oh, late Ray Bradbury. Ray Bradbury. Yeah. Wow, that's yeah. pretty sweet. Yeah. I wonder if I wonder if the uh, <laughs> I wonder if when the when it it it, it the oh never mind. What? <laughs> never mind. I'm, I was trying to think like wonder if it would run into its old lab bench in Iowa or what but it was uh, never mind. It's just <laughs> that one didn't go anywhere. Doesn't make sense. <laughs> All right. Take us someplace scientific. Justin. All right, uh, the ancient Greek philosophers, well, really Socrates, but uh, considered the ability to know thyself as a pinnacle of humanity. Oh, I love this story. Yes. Young man, know thyself. Now, thousands of years later, and a lot of lost knowledge, uh, neuroscientists are trying to decipher precisely how the human brain constructs our sense of self. Self-awareness is defined as being aware of yourself, self-conscious, self-knowing, knowing that you're you and that people are there and being able to recognize yourself in a mirror and carry on conversations with yourself as though other people were listening. It includes <laughs> one's traits, feelings, behaviors. Neuroscientists have believed that the three brain regions, the three brain regions specifically, are critical for self-awareness. The insular cortex, the anterior cingulate cortex and the medial prefrontal cortex. However, research team led by the University of Iowa has challenged this theory by showing that, so, that self-awareness is more of a product of the network of the brain than it is any one specific region. And then it is any one. The uh, conclusions came from a rare opportunity to study a person with extensive brain damage to the three regions believed critical for self-awareness. This person, 57-year-old college-educated man known as Patient R, passed all <laughs> standard tests of self-awareness. He also displayed repeated self-recognition, both when looking into the mirror and when identifying himself in unaltered photographs taken during periods all throughout his life. With... What this research clearly shows is that self-awareness corresponds to a brain process that cannot be localized to a single region of the brain, says David Rudroff, co-corresponding author, uh, author of the uh, paper, which is, if you want to take a look at it, it's August 22nd, Journal Plus One. In all likelihood, self-awareness emerges from much more distributed interactions among networks of the brain regions. Very interesting. Yeah, I love I love this um, this story because it really gets at um, some of the assumptions that people make. Like a lot of researchers for a long time have had this idea of the brain as having these very discrete uh, nuclei, we call them, and these regions or brain regions that are very specific to their functions, and so. Um, the insular cortex or the uh, prefrontal cortex or whatever, uh, the, the medial prefrontal cortex, you know, off to the side, this one little bit over here, being responsible for self-awareness, consciousness. And so you get rid of those areas or they're damaged and then you still have self-awareness, you still have consciousness. What does that mean? It, it starts, starts undermining these assumptions that the this kind of uh, very, uh, I guess, broad ability is broad and brain wide rather than uh, just being in these little tiny regions. Yeah, this is a great quote. According to previous research, this man should be a zombie. <laughs> <laughs> but as we have yeah. shown, he certainly is not one. And when you when you once you've had a chance to meet him, you immediately recognize that he's self-aware. In an interview, the uh, patient R uh, described himself. He says, "I am just a normal person with a bad memory, <laughs> a really bad memory, mm. <laughs> like amnesia memory." Yeah, you know, that's really interesting. So, so the us, the us part, like you're supposed to be like. Uh, you know, it, it starts from what's you, what's me, what's us, and then, okay, this is me. I, we'll, we'll go down to the body. The body is me. But if I lose my hand, well, I didn't 
that's that's not my body now. I, I lost that. That's just a part. It's just these are all parts, and it's in the mm -hmm. brain. This is who I am. I'm this brain, right? Mm -hmm. And then they had it down to specific regions of the brain that are you. But now, no, you mess with those regions, and well, I lost a couple parts. <laughs> I lost some more parts. Parts of my brain, but now they're just parts, not part now of me. Now they're just anymore. parts, right? They're just, they're just that's a great way to parts. think about it. And then, but I'm still here, you know. Well, my memory's not too great, but I'm still here. I'm still in this brain. I'm still, I'm still this brain. So it's, I guess it's whatever's left, the brain will cons uh, still consider itself a self, which is pretty yeah. awesome. Which is well, why oh, go ahead. I'm just standing, do not unplug this. Uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> Blair, oh, Blair, by the way, you, as being becoming an intern, you signed off on one of your duties as intern. The only actual duty I will ever press upon you. Some, some people say DNR. That's n Justin is always R. Always resuscitate. resuscitate. Always keep plugged in. <laughs> yeah. Even if there's a, f the, even if you don't see the flicker of life left, I, I could just be in dreamland and I'm fine. I'm fine in here. Even if I'm never coming yeah, back out right. there with you all, I'm okay. still good in here. I'll be fine. Noted. Just, but that's one yeah. of your jobs is to make sure nobody unplugs me. Oh, okay. It was, yeah. it was so Allie's, is this, is this I, your your uh your living video will right, right now? <laughs> it always is. This is my all, testament. Do not unplug me. Yeah. If I'm, I'm trying to come back, uh, maybe. It depends on how nice it is. If I'm not trying uh, to come back, it's because everything's fine. <laughs> We're right here. But I I love this this whole story. The um other parts of the, of the research that's been that's been done. They've also compared uh this guy, patient R, against children with uh, hydroencephaly or hyperencephaly, where the uh, the brain is very minimal and the basically the cerebral cortex does not exist, is mm -hmm. non-existent and mm -hmm. um, most of these, most children born with this don't make it past the first year. Some do go on to uh, to live and respond to have uh, they don't they're not verbal but they're able to exist and respond to stimulation recognize people and have some form of consciousness so mm -hmm. they're conscious but because they're not verbal we still can't really tell whether or not they're self-aware right and so there's this guy with just a few areas within his brain that we thought were related to self-awareness that now it's like, okay, so the brain is much more of a network and so there's a lot of areas that are probably making up for the ones that are lacking in this guy. Um, a lot of uh, connections probably back and forth between different areas in this guy. Okay, now let's go to these kids with hydroencephaly and 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 try and find out maybe we can do some of the similar to do similar experiments where they did one where they smudge which is something we look for in animals where you mm -hmm. smudge the animal with um, with something so okay. that they don't realize that you've put a mark on them but you have and then if you show them a mirror they know that they need to right. wipe the that something's on them that they need to mm -hmm. wipe off mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so they did that with patient R and he responded in the I am self aware way this is me in the mirror, and I'm seeing wait, wait, wait. this back Why black smudge on my nose. Because I got the video. When you said, I am self-aware, you did the quotation fingers. You don't think he's self-aware. You think he's No, that was just not. No, 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 no. The, my quotation fingers were implying that that's uh, the standard response. Okay, so um, related to that, I just For wanted to talk about, um, since we're talking about awareness and self-awareness and consciousness. I did see this one article that I wanted to talk about related to that since we're talking about locations and brain and stuff like that. This does tie in, I promise. Octopuses? Octopuses. Yes! They found... I wasn't planning on doing this story, but I just... I love octopuses. They're smart. We love them here Cephalopods as well. are amazing. But we found recently that, well, some some researchers have decided the that octopuses have consciousness or they're calling it subjective awareness. Yeah. So so here's the so here's the the thing. There's another uh, group that have um, a bunch of Cambridge, uh, a bunch of professors got together at Cambridge University and signed this thing saying that basically all animals are conscious. And so that now now they they're saying there there's a distinction between consciousness and self awareness. So okay. humans 
you and I, we know that we are self-aware. Right. You are aware of yourself in this environment, okay. and you can think about your consciousness. Okay. And so you have like this meta ability right. over your consciousness. But we, and so right. now it's defining an animal like the octopus right. as conscious. Right. So now, so now what they're, they're saying is that. what they're calling subjective awareness is that they, you know, they know they exist, which would just be a consciousness, right? But that they will actually plan and use a stepwise plan mm. and for instance, cash food and things like that, that not all um, animals are known to have, but they have they have a subjective awareness where they they know that that they that they they have a future involved with them. I guess mm -hmm. is the idea that mm -hmm. if you know that that there's a future and you can plan for a future as an animal, planning counts as a subjective mm -hmm. awareness because you're not just living in the moment, right? At that moment, or yeah. you would eat everything you could at that second. Yeah. Um, Which and is so like why some they, there's a, a a term that was coined. Uh, it's autonoetic. Consciousness okay. is another is um, so you and I can recall all of the uh, the salient components uh -huh. of an experience, and we've uh, with researchers that I've worked with in the bird world, um, we've been able to show that there are some birds that have this sub subjective autonoetic okay. awareness uh -huh. where they're uh, able to recall specific aspects. Of experiences, right? Which again allows them to plan mm -hmm. for future events. Yeah, and we've seen with with animals like cuttlefish that are super close related to octopuses. They're um, they're also cephalopods that they they can remember things also that they can call things back from a memory bank. You can show a cephalopod something where if you show them a black and white checkered flag and they get a treat, and you show them a red flag and they don't get a treat. If you show them that months later, they will know what that checkered flag means which it's not mm -hmm. just a trained response of an yeah. impulse. Um, but basically, the, wa the reason I wanted to bring this up is that this we don't know as much about uh, uh, a location for this kind of thing in an octopus mm -hmm. brain either because octopus brains are so weird. <laughs> they're, they're basically a, a very small, teeny tiny, compared to their body size, donut. And their mm -hmm. esophagus goes through the middle of their brain. Ugh. And so one of my favorite awesome. things about cephalopods it's like a gang is that, ganglia. Yeah, is that yeah. if they if they eat something that's too big, they will get brain damage because it bangs into their brain when they're <laughs> swallowing it. Which wow. I think is hilarious. That's, oof, but that that's but if you have a distributed network, so if yeah. you have lots of these little ganglia uh -huh. work together and networked together in the donut. Right. But if you bump one of them, the other ones are gonna take up the slack until that right. one can kind of heal itself. Yes. Yes, for sure. But so don't the reason, really yeah. the reason I bring it up, though, is that it's this tiny little donut, and it's not anything like a mammal brain that we're Nothing. used to looking at. Yeah. But they still have these intense, intelligent responses to things. So even if we were to find loci for uh, self-awareness or, in this case, something like subjective awareness in a, in a human brain or in a monkey brain, once you look at then you'd have to try to find it in another animal brain. It's just, it has to be more complex than just this part of this brain does this. Is if it's if it's able to be, uh, if it's able to um, evolve over and over in all these different uh, branches, it has to. It it seems to me like there there's probably something more complex than just this one area popping up and causing that. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. I agree. <laughs> like, am I saying that right? <laughs> Does that make sense when I say that? Donut brain. Donut brain. I am so Same, used, different. I, I mean, but it is. I mean, bird brain used to be. Love? <laughs> bird brain used to be, a, you know, a put down. But now we know that birds mm -hmm. are really bright for their brain size. And so it's not so much of a put down. And I was just thinking how awesome it would be to call somebody a donut brain. <laughs> that doesn't even I work either. I would be happy either. to be a donut brain. <sighs> doesn't work either. Yeah. I can't even call somebody an octopus brain. Justin. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Uh, should we move move on? It's getting towards the end of the show. Um, I have a story about blood cells. We've from time to time hit on the uh, stem cell story and some Johns Hopkins researchers uh, publishing in the Public Library of Science PLOS um, have described their methods part of an effort to uh, be able to create induced pluripot pluripotent stem cells that could replace embryonic stem cells in the laboratory and in our search for a way to uh, cure debilitating diseases and um, the and problems with our physiology the human physiology um so we know embryonic stem cells are quite controversial and so we have been using in the laboratory embryonic stem cells and what are called induced pluripotent stem cells which are stem cells that have been that were once something else like a blood cell or skin cell and were induced to kind of go back in time to a a more baby-like state a, uh, huh. a very early developmental stage called the stem cell and so the pluripotent phrase means that they can become any type of cell at all so it could have started out as a blood cell been induced to become pluripotent and then you can take that induced pluripotent stem cell and turn it into a brain cell a muscle cell a blood cell again skin cell doesn't matter it could it has the instructions every cell within our body at some has the instructions within it to be able to become any other cell if given the right stimuli so problem with the induced plur pluripotent stem cells at this point in time is that we've only been able to induce them give them the instructions to go back to that early developmental stage using viruses and so the viruses viruses are good at, infect, at infecting things right so the viruses are able to get into say a blood cell and inject um, DNA uh, instructions or protein instructions into the cell that then allow it to go backwards but coming from a viral source um, means that the, there could be problems related to that and the and having the the viral induction is not something that we want to have and so it's been kind of a the, the holy grail of this uh, area of research is to be able to create induced pluripotent stem cells that are virus free and that can be produced very efficiently quickly cheaply virus free that's what they want it's so hard to get there however um, Johns Hopkins Institute researchers uh, Elias Zamb Zambidis uh, and his team uh, report that this is what they have done they have uh, used um, growth factors and plasmids uh, plasmids are uh, not virus related they are and they use an electrical zapping of cells to allow the plasmids to merge with the cell membranes of the cells that they were inducing uh, and insert the DNA instructions and the growth factor uh, instructions that were needed so this the the science behind it is sound what they're doing is really neat and it's virus free and they seem to have a very high uh, a high rate of of uh, indu induction of these from blood cell to induced pluripotent stem cells and those then can they've been able to convert to other stem cell types since then to other cell types since then so um, it seems like this is uh, going to be a really big advancement for the field of stem cell science huh. yeah sweet yeah, I'm excited by it. I think it's really, really it's awesome. amazing. So potentially, yeah. we we could have just a constant source of stem cells going to research labs. Yeah. So so <laughs> imagine. So 
not just research labs. So once we get to the point of, okay, we've got stem cells, we know they're from a good, healthy source, uh -huh. we know they're not uh, uh, infected with any kind of virus that might mm -hmm. you know, come out at some point and in, interact with our DNA in any way, um, in the laboratory we can use stem cells to be able to grow livers, maybe, right. or grow new hearts, or grow, you know, grow organs for organ transplants, or grow blood for blood transfusions. Right. You know, all of the different, if you can create every cell type in the body for somebody who's sick and needs something, but do it rapidly as well. So w the problem with embryonic stem cells is that, okay, first you have to um, find a way, if a person is sick, to get the cells from uh, their sex cells, be able to create a blastocyst, get the embryonic mm -hmm. cells from it. Like there are all these, that, te that technology to be able to grow you a liver if you're having right. liver failure, that's going to be so slow and take, it's going to be invasive and just very difficult. However, with this kind of technique, if they could just take a little blood from you um, and within what they say, they converted uh, to these, they, they converted the cells to a primitive stem cell state, with, state within seven to 14 days. So within a week mm. or two, take the blood that you gave convert it to a primitive stem cell state, and then from there be able to turn it into mm -hmm. a liver cell, whatever it is that you need, um, that would speed the process up and maybe allow you know the growth of a liver for you to happen much more quickly than it would otherwise. So this kind of a technology, I mean, the advanced, the possibilities are very exciting. It's really wow. exciting. Yeah. And it doesn't get mixed up with any of the things that people get upset about. You right, know? exactly. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> it just it's gets rid of that. All, it's going to make all stem cell research that we're doing just so much easier in so many ways. Oh, yeah. It's going to be easier to get it. It's going to be easier to grow them. It's going to be easier um, to, you know, mm -hmm. politically get them. Yeah, because right yeah. now, um, if you want to work with embryonic stem cells, then you have to, you're limited to a very, very short list mm -hmm. of, of uh, cell sources. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, the other pluripotent stem cells that you might be working with, you can't really give them to anybody because you've got viruses involved mm -hmm. and that, the human research, blah, blah, blah. So now this, this is very exciting. Yay! If I, can, if I can, can get it across to you, how exciting mm. this is for medical future. <laughs> I can have a new liver. <laughs> yes. For those oh. of us who are alcoholics, <laughs> let me raise my glass of vodka to you. <laughs> really I'll just grow a new one. It'll be fine. It's going to change one. things. Yeah. <laughs> if you could have a liver that easily, that's really going to change the way things go. Mm hmm. <laughs> Ah, oh, dear. Any more stories there, Justin? There are. There's some more over here. There. Um, this one's a little interesting. Uh, space time, maybe a giant smoothie. <laughs> this is a smoothie. Physicist uh, Robert Nemiroff of Michigan oh. Technological University reached this heady conclusion after studying the tracings of three count them three photons of differing wavelengths that have been recorded by NASA's Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope in May of 2009. These photons originated about 7 billion light years away. <clears throat> that means that whatever sent them in this direction that happened 7 billion years ago. Mm. And in uh, away from Earth, mm -hmm. one of three pulses from gamma ray bursts that arrived 7 billion light arrived at the orbiting telescope just one millisecond apart. Basically, they got a tie. Gamma ray bursts are the short-lived bursts of gamma ray photons, most energetic form of light. They can originate from far across the universe, and you know, astronomers believe they're caused by giant stars collapsing billions of years before the Earth was even formed. <clears throat> gamma ray bursts can tell us some very interesting things about the universe, Nimiroff said. In this case, those three photons recorded, recorded by the Fermi telescope suggest that space-time may not be as bubbly, wobbly, gobbledy as scientists, some scientists think. 
Some theories in quantum gravity say that the universe is not smooth but foamy, made of fundamental units called Planck lengths that are less than a trillionth of a trillionth of the diameter of a hydrogen atom. Planck lengths are so small that there's no way to detect them, except via photons like those that make up gamma ray bursts. Here's why. Wavelengths of the photons are some of the shortest distances known to science. So short they should interact with even smaller Planck length. If they interact, the photons should be dispersed, scattered on their trek through Planck length, pixelated out into the oblivion of space-time. But these three, yes, three photons arrived in the same place, virtually at the same time, which would indicate there wasn't any scattering over the billions of years of or traveling through the universe. And that space, at least between here and there, seven billion light years away, is relatively smooth. Very interesting. So it's smoother than what was expected. Like it should have been foamier and bubblier. Yeah. And the the light should have been interrupted a bit more than it was. Yes, uh, Nimrov, uh, Nimrov goes, <clears throat> We have shown that the universe is smooth across the Planck mass. That means there's no choppiness that is detectable. It's really a cool discovery. We're very excited. <laughs> 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 That's good. <laughs> I'm glad the researchers are excited. It's a very cool discovery. It really is. It's fantastic. Yeah, I was you when you started talking about how the universe is like more like a smoothie. I was thinking, well, didn't Brian Greene describe it as like a trampoline with a bowling ball in it? There's all there are all these different analogies for what the universe is supposed to be like. It's all the same universe anyway. Man. Depends on your perspective. That's right. Uh, well, you know what? I got a good perspective. And we've hit the end of our show. I think, I think, we've, so. got, I think we've gotten a whole bunch of science out this week. <sighs> There's still more. There's still more. And uh, so we will be back here again next week. We're going to come back once again, and we're going to be on Google Plus using the on-air Hangouts, hopefully mm -hmm. with even fewer problems that we mm -hmm. have. One less problem every week. That's all I ask. Um, but this also broadcasts live to YouTube and you can watch it at YouTube Live or at YouTube.com slash This Week in Science. Um, and you can always find us by following us on all the social media outlets. And uh, we do have a Google Plus page for This Week in Science and there's also um, my Google Plus account Kiki Sanford if you look for it. And uh, shout outs as usual to everyone who is making this journey with us. We do appreciate you joining us and I wanted to give a shout out to Joe Paul Cates who turned 40 today. Happy birthday. Congratulations Happy birthday. on making it to such a wonderful round number. And I think that about does it. Take us to the end, Justin. Thank you, everybody, for listening. We hope you enjoyed the show. Twist is available as a podcast. Just Google This Week in Science in the iTunes directory. If you have an Android device, you can look for Twist for Droid. That's Twist, T-W-I-S, the number four droid in the Android marketplace. And we are also Twist, T-W-I-S, on the iPhone's marketplace thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and for more information on anything that you've heard here today, show notes are going to be available at our website, twist.org. We also want to hear from you, so email us. I'm Kirsten, K-I-R-S-T-E-N, at thisweekinscience.com. You can also contact Justin at thisweekinscience.com or twistminion at gmail.com. And Blair, you have an email, right? Yeah, I'm BlairBaz at gmail.com. There we go. Yeah, you can also find us on the Twitter at Dr. Kiki, at Jacksonfly, at Blair's Menagerie. <laughs> uh, we love. We, we love also have Twist Science. Yes, right? oh, Twist Science. Twist Science. In fact, you can follow us more places than we could all possibly be at once. <laughs> <laughs> we love your feedback. If there is a topic you would like us to cover or address, if there is a suggestion you have for an interview, a subject that you really, really, really want to hear more about, please let us know. 
And we're going to be back here once again next week, as I said, and we do hope that you will join us for more great science news. And if you've learned anything from today's show, remember... It's all in your head. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. Cause this week's science is coming your way. So everybody listen to what I say. I use the scientific method for all that it's worth. And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth. Cause it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news. That what I say may not represent your views. But I've done the calculations and I've got a plan. If you listen to the science, you may just get understand That we're not trying to threaten your philosophy We're just trying to save the world from jeopardy Jeopardy, jeopardy. And this week in science is coming your way So everybody listen to everything we say And if you use our method instead of rolling a die We may rid the world of toxoplasma Got the eye Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science. This week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science. I've got a laundry list of items I want to address From stopping global hunger to dredging Loch Ness I'm trying to promote more rational thought And I'll try to answer any question you've got so how can I ever see the changes I seek When I can only set up shop one hour a week? This week in science is coming your way You better just listen to what we say And if you've learned anything from the words that we've said Then please just remember it's all in your head Cause it's this week in science This week in science this week in science, 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 science. This week in science, this week in science. This week in science, 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 science. 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 This week in science, this week in 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 science. Justin's back. <laughs> My clown nose is a giant atom. <laughs> okay. Uh, I haven't made a molecule yet. I don't think these things are the best for making molecules. I put at the right angles. Yeah, I think I want this to be at ones like have different angles. So like that one's like a mm, but they're all like, like a water one. Yeah, but they're all very. I guess this one has a little bit better. The one I had when I was in uh, chemistry, or I guess yeah, it was chemistry, like ochem. They were the the the, the sticky things in between that are supposed to be the bonds. Yes. Um, they were they were bendy, and so you could do like a covalent I bond. Like that. You could it's hard do to get bendy like a I double bond or a triple bond. Hate some then balsa they would wood. Bend. Yeah. They were like um they were like a uh, um uh, a bendy straw. 
in the middle, you know, mm -hmm. it was like that. Yeah, I think what I'm thinking is that like these should not be exactly on the uh, equator of oh, these, yeah. that they should be down slightly because yep. if you're like really going to be putting molecules in, that's going to be like forcing them apart a little bit more. So this is like too accurate. <laughs> it's just not, or not accurate. The things I get annoyed about. I don't even what are you what making? I have no idea. I'm just making things up. You should have said something like. I'm making an acetylcysteine. Oh. <laughs> yeah. AT I'm, making, I'm gonna uh, make ATP. Yeah. Or uh, I be able to. I don't know. If, I don't think I have enough. I don't think I have enough atoms. Adenosine triphosphate. Yeah, yeah, that'd be pretty big. Messing with the forces of nature. <laughs> ha ha ha! That's pretty funny. <laughs> 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 the forces of nature. Yeah, I'm just making all sorts of stuff up there. It's not not accurate chemistry whatsoever. <laughs> yeah. Carbon should be tetrahedral. There is a Yeah. I'll have to figure I have to play with it more. I haven't played with it enough. I'm just afraid my child's gonna swallow the balls if he gets near it, so I haven't taken it out to just like Play. Ooh, yeah. build a molecule. Smith. Yes. Let's build a molecule. Simulator simulatorix. Hmm. What does it say? How does it do it? Build a molecule. Mm, nice. When I was uh, in college, we had to do a protein report one time. Mm -hmm. And... Um, <laughs> I'm such an animal nerd that I had to pick um, the lactase protein that was in uh, specifically monotreme milk. Oh, really? Because I just wanted to talk about monotremes. Monotremes. Like, sorry, guys. You're going to have to listen to me talk about platypuses for 20 minutes before I show you anything from CNET that is proteins. You're going to have to just wait. <laughs> This is what we're gonna do. My teacher was nice. She was very uh, tolerant. Well, I right, went off it. on my animal tangent. <laughs> yeah, here we go. CH4, right? Does that work, you guys? See, the, this should go down. It's mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It should be, yeah. I want to put it angles. Mm -hmm. Angles down. But it's a good start. It is. Yeah, the carbon is wrong. <laughs> oh yeah, I've had an animal corner since I was probably old enough to speak. So <laughs> that's it's just nice someone else can listen now besides no. my parents and friends who have been, gotten so sick of it. Really? You can tell us about more animal stuff? Yes. What yes, do you yes. want to tell me about the animal, Blair? Just get it over with. I tell you everything about the animal. <gasps> Identity 4, you recorded the audio. Yes, I need it. I need. Yes. Can you Dropbox me? That would be awesome. Ha ha ha, Euchre. My molecular skills are a gas. Hmm. Uh -huh, I see what you did but, um, there. Shh. That's right. Yes, yes, yes. Need the audio. <laughs> My family did get pretty sick of the uh, the invertebrate sex talk. I think they find it interesting to a certain point, but then they just, you know. It was. It all started. <laughs> Do you want to hear where the invertebrate sex talk started? Because there is an origin story. Really? Yeah. We got it. We got an origin story. Yeah. This? Awesome. So, okay. um, this woman who used to be the penguin keeper at the zoo a long time ago, mm -hmm. she started when I was a teenager. She started doing what she had deemed sex tours at mm -hmm. the zoo, and 
I forget what it's called now. Oh, now it's called Woo at the Zoo is what mm. they call it now. And it's during um, mm. it's during the Valentine season, and you get champagne and strawberries, and and they used to take you around the zoo and talk about all of the animals' sexual habits. And so, as a 16, 17 year old, I brought a couple of the animal visitors into the great hall when they were having their champagne and their strawberries. Yeah. And so, I I don't know why they had the teenage volunteers doing this. But I came in with some of the animals, and she would talk about, she would, you know, bring, I brought out the porcupine, and she'd talk about the porcupine sex habits, and then brought out the alligator, and she talked about the alligator, and then she would go off on these tangents, um, and I learned about praying mantises that way, um, which is a very fun story. So that's kind of where it started. I was just fascinated by how every animal has this intense evolutionary path where sometimes the males and the females are in an arms race yeah. <laughs> and other times you know it, it works a little bit differently but like with the spiders that we've talked about yeah mm -hmm. but it's it was fascinating to me how something so simple and so basic to being a living thing on this planet and an animal yeah. on this planet can be so different from species to species it was just fascinating to me yeah it is fascinating yeah. Story. It's yeah. good. You would think porcupines do it very carefully. You would be wrong. <laughs> Hair knows. I do. There's, in fact, not all porcupines do it the same. Different porcupines have different ways. So, really? Yeah. There's like creativity. Well, they're different out of necessity. I don't know. Do you want to know more than that? <laughs> Does it have to do with quill directions? Well. It has to do with quills. So um, porcupine quills have have um, what I can only describe as antibiotic powder. It has a powder on them that helps keep them from getting sticky and gross and greasy, but it mm. also has uh, bacteria, antibacterial elements to the powder. I don't know the exact chemistry behind it That's or the awesome. biology behind it, but... Does anybody? I don't know. I don't know. That's I just know that they have it because not only so they don't quill themselves and get an infection, but there's lots of quills dispelled <laughs> during the act, and that way they don't get infected. But actually, North American porcupines, it's quite harrowing. It's not a great story. The females don't want to be any part, have any part of it, but the males will chase her up a tree, and it will usually be multiple males, and they will all have their way with her before ah! it's over. Oh my goodness. So she, she dispels a lot of quills during that interaction. Yes, she does. So that's that's the North American porcupines. <laughs> Which, that's kind of an odd phenomenon to me, because there are animals that are like that, where the the females just won't do it willingly. Yeah. And you would that's think... That's just the way it works. At some, at some point, there would be some females that would be like, all right, fine, whatever. <laughs> then they wouldn't get injured in the act of sex. Which, right, it wouldn't be so traumatic to if, the female. And it's like, it's something so fundamental to your existence. You have to reproduce. Why are you against it? I don't know. It's very odd. But some animals are like that. <laughs> Ah, uh, you yeah. people in the chat room, you're pretty funny. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I'm just looking at all the words. Oh, no. Purples. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That's the pan. Yeah. So that's the North American porcupine. I might save the prehensile tailed porcupine for another night because that's Did an you involved say story. Prehensile tailed porcupine? Oh, have you not seen them? No. They're my favorite thing. That's one of my favorite animals. I thought the... your favorite thing was the big ah, mouth guy, the frog mouth. Yes, that's well I have many favorite things. <laughs> <laughs> but um uh okay, prehensile tailed so... porcupines are also called coendus. Um but they have a giant pig nose that's squishy <laughs> that but they're weird. adorable I ha there's one at the zoo she was one of my favorite animals I ever worked with her name is Sassafras Aww. but um, actually I might have a picture with Sassafras yes. somewhere national here's a prehensile tailed porcupine from the national zoo see now I have to scroll around and try to find mm -hmm. my picture with her but um they have they have quite an involved story. What are they also called? Coendus. Coendus. Yeah, with the C. 
Look at that little squishy nose. It, she's cute. Does it get bigger? Oh, I, I found a picture. Oh, Here, can I... Let's see if I can do this. Oh, there's a picture! Wait, oh. Put it in the chat room. Okay, hold on. I'm trying. Hold on. Open image in new tab. There we go. Here, here's a picture of me with sassafras. Here, let me... Okay. And I can do this. Uh-huh. <laughs> Her nose is so squishy. <laughs> there. That's super cute. <laughs> oh, I love sassafras. <laughs> Are porcupines relatively mild mannered? Uh, it depends on how they were raised. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Huh. If they're raised around humans and they're touched from the time they're smaller and just like any animal you can desensitize them to certain stimuli. Like, yeah. Yeah. She she climbs right up on your hands on her own. I don't even have to pick her up. Wow. She'll come right up to me. She just wants some corn. She'll get some corn, and she can just hang out. And I will actually take her to schools, and 30 kids will pet her, and she's fine with that. Wow. But w the picture that you saw before was that's what they do when they get scared. All the quills go straight out. Mm -hmm. And that's basically the magic in training an animal to be used for education is to reverse that so they're comfortable around people. and What would normally be a threatening situation. Mm -hmm. yeah. Exactly. And they're yeah. just so used to it. There's, oh, this is how I get my corn. Pet, pet, piece of corn. Pet, pet. Piece of corn. Piece of corn. Maybe a beet. I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I wonder if they actually come to enjoy the contact. I or... think they do. Yeah. Certain so animals do. Yeah. Um, so a lot of them, I would say, they're just impartial. They're just like, hey, this is my job. This is what I do for my treats. Right. <laughs> but there's other animals, I think, that definitely do appreciate it. The fact that she will step up onto my hands even when I don't have a treat means that there's something she's getting from hanging out with me that she likes. Mm -hmm. Which I think is interesting because I don't know much about porcupine behavior, but, you know, how much social activity do they have? They've right. got these big quills on them, right. so I'm, are they touching each other and grooming each other yeah. a lot? So... How many animals out there, you know, could possibly enjoy the yeah. contact that we need? Right. You know, as humans, like, if a child is not touched, that child is not going to develop properly. And yeah. so, you know, yeah. but in an animal, that's not going to necessarily be the same. But I, I just... It, that, that's a, that's a very interesting question. Yeah. I think that's also it, if... if for instance, you know, the rhino. Rhinos are solitary, 100%. Mm -hmm. But that rhino comes running over whether I have treats or not and wants me to pet him on the nose. He likes that. He yeah. comes across the exhibit for it. Yeah. And I just don't know if because they were raised around that, they're used to seeing humans and, oh, that's my person that gives me food. Let me go over there, mm -hmm. you know? And I, I think that, I think a lot of it, you know, it's a nature versus nurture argument again, because yeah. it's, yeah. if, if you're, they if have you're, the capacity. Yeah, they, exactly. They, a lot, some animals have the capacity. A snake, for example, hmm, so I don't know how much they have a capacity to enjoy a person. They enjoy, um, this is warm. Yeah. But I don't think that a snake will. Snakes are different. Yeah. Reptiles in general. It's reptiles reptile are, brain. they're just, Yeah. I think they have less complex things going on in their brain. They're not social animals. They don't have the capacity to be social. I think maybe that has yeah. something to do with it. Is that even though a rhino is solitary, maybe a ancestor that they had wasn't. Right. And I think maybe there are deep-seated roots where, you know, those little shrews that came about right after the mass extinction that were the beginning of pretty much all mammals, they were most likely social animals. Mm -hmm. Those l small... Mammals were uh, animals that lived in big groups, usually. Mm -hmm. A small underground mammal is going to be in a big colony. So yeah. because of that, I just wonder if that's carried through. And so it's pretty easy to switch back on in an animal that maybe wouldn't normally want it. I don't know. Well, but the, I think, Kirsten, you said something that, that's very interesting. That if a, a human child isn't touched and loved and hugged and held, it doesn't develop properly. What is properly? You know, it, it won't it won't be raised uh, domesticated. It won't be be civil. It won't be 
you know, what all the things that we sort of cherish and call them, consider normal, but aren't very normal. We're not very normal animals. We have this very bizarre sort of existence. So I wonder if that's, you know, like you look at dogs. Dogs love getting petted. Cats love getting you come up and you scratch them behind the ears and everything. Right? These are domesticated animals that love the social touch that humans are into, right? But you don't see, like, wild cats, like, you know, <laughs> pining for somebody to pet them. A feral cat is very skittish and doesn't want anybody or anything, even other cats around it. So I, I, there, is something, there is something really interesting in, I, I, in this sort of domestication by touch, by comfort, mm -hmm. by relaxation, mm -hmm. by soothing away those... those Maybe it's soothing away the hormones, like that would come in that fright or fright, like that the uh, that uh, that porcupine. That porcupine probably isn't getting its brains uh, fight or flight, you know, juices yeah. going with yeah. a room full of children. It's sedated, which it it's calm. which it should be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> well, yeah. yeah children like, just wonder scary. if <laughs> being touched without be, without pain has something to do with it is yeah that's the that's probably a lot of the fear is if there's a face if there's a hand coming towards your face you're worried you're going to get hit gonna or grabbed yeah. something bad is going to happen to you it. i don't think you're worried about it i don't think you have a choice in it I, I mean i don't think it's a conscious um rational decision making thing that's going on necessarily that you're about to get hit or that you know some, somebody's going to poke the porcupine i think it's i think it's the brain reacting before uh, the rational mind, you know, and then experience, like having the experience of being petted by kids and getting corn, you know, the porcupine can actually be a little bit more rational about the the whole situation. Oh, okay, this is yeah. this is cool. I know what's going to happen here. I know what the future is going to hold. This isn't going to be an unexpected thing. I don't have to rely on this fight or flight part of my brain that's kicking, you know, adrenaline through my body. I can override it and be <laughs> a little bit of a a little bit of a sentient, self-aware porcupine for this one, for this one situation. I wonder if that's it. I wonder if that's the real secret to, to intellectual uh, evolution in humans. I have no idea. Um, hey, can you re-record the uh, disclaimer? Nope. I have no idea where it is. <laughs> <laughs> It got it got crumpled and launched somewhere. <laughs> and oh my gosh. I have and because it was handwritten and this was all like last minute, I don't even have I can't even there's not like a digital copy of it anywhere. Oh, I think he just needs you to say disclaimer three times. Is that what it where when did he come oh. in? Part of the disclaimer got cut off in my recording. Any chance of re-recording the three disclaimers? Yeah, I think you yeah. just need to say it. Ooh. Can, can, I, can I ask you, though, uh, Identity 4? Yeah. Is there a chance that there is somewhere on the Internet <laughs> uh, another, another place where I've recorded three disclaimers? <laughs> I'm, not that I'm unwilling to do this. You know this. what? Totally if it's just if it's just it's if it's just the three disclaimers, I think I got this. Because I think I yeah. Because I think I've got. I think I got over this. a thousand versions <laughs> of me saying disclaimer. This oh, and then there was always this. Hold on, where is it? Oh 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 oh! oh. I thought I had it in here. Disclaimer! 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 The following hour programming will corrupt you. Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. Listeners should be wary and dripping. Disclaimer, disclaimer, <laughs> disclaimer. Once we become comfortable with fake science journals. Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. Getting it wrong is a commonplace occurrence. Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. Whether the universe is made of brains, or more like spaghetti in a strainer. We're ready to explain all the secrets of the universe. That is, of course, assuming all the humans don't destroy it first. Moving in the distance is the doom of our existence. Like a piece of pizza microwave that high for 30 minutes. Or a cake you make and shove it to the oven overnight. You can smother with the frosting, but it still won't taste right. Science is the chef mixing up the best ingredients. The genius is when it falls within the standard deviance. But even when it doesn't, you can learn from 
a mistake Like if you try to bake a pie And instead you get a steak Learning from what turns out wrong important to the mission If you don't adjust your vision Then you're just a politician Wishing some magician Can make all the wrong food disappear But now I make myself hungry Let's get out of here Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer Disclaimer, the murder of innocent Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer Producing reality Wall Street financial analysts Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer Empty minds that are about to crash over us like a big wave Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer The earth is an annoying thing <laughs> That's a good one Disclaimer, disclaimer The only thing that's strange in the fiction All the facts in contradiction with a rational thought But that's what quantum theory brought And it makes my mind weary with the havoc that it's wrought I'm far from the thumbs I know some particles are runs But explain to me how they can be in two places at once That's a trick I'd like to try when the in-laws drop by And I can tell them for the summer resort and never need to fly Science will tackle all the incomprehensible And try to make sense of all the dense and nonsensical Like strings, rings, really small things and dark matter And the universe expanding Guess that's why I'm getting fatter So with all my understanding they be lacking where I want it Thankfully there's people smarter than me working on it So I'll pretend to comprehend the snack that I just bought Cause I've completely lost the train of thought Disclaimer, <laughs> disclaimer, disclaimer There are much smaller people that can corrupt knowledge Disclaimer, <laughs> disclaimer, disclaimer The bad isn't addictive Global warming isn't happening Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer I've changed my opinion over the years never kill you Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer Wait a few times if you think it will help for centuries, scientists have been villainized, and I don't just mean in horror movies as cool as those characters are. Copernicus was excommunicated for teaching that the Earth was not the center of the universe. Da Vinci did anatomical drawings in secret because dissection was forbidden. Galileo had really nasty things written on a piece of paper and taped to his back without his knowledge. Heck, Darwin's teachings are still being viewed as a sign of the apocalypse 150 years later. The way these people talk, you'd think Einstein was the angel of death and Stephen Hawking was a freaking antichrist! Well, tell hey, me maybe. for me as I bring about the destruction of mankind. Huh. 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 <laughs> disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer! We're seeking the truth, so we should be a no-brainer that we're always right as we enlighten you with the science news. But the truths that we discover may not represent the views of the University of California, Davis, Kennedy, yes, or its sponsors. And while scientists are not monsters, they may still be portrayed that way on sci-fi Saturday nights. They're really curing various plates and helping her to white inner whites. This is science! What not a boo ha ha changing stanzas while I go buy some oceanfront property in Kansas so race into space and see how far we go cause the universe is even bigger than Kanye West Eagle and although I know I've mastered the art of the run on sentence I still have to mention disclaimer 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 do not be limited by bacon and vodka and potato chips disclaimer <laughs> disclaimer disclaimer the scientists are hired assassins disclaimer 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 so science therefore rejects ultimate fighting on Television. Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. As we do each week here on This Week in Science. Coming up next. Oh, nice. And he, ha he even got the crumpling of the paper. Yeah. It was yeah. nicely done. I love that it was song. very well done. Oh, was that from the 2010? I thought it was from the, no, it was the 2009 compilation, wasn't it? Yeah, it had to be from a long time ago. The 2010? Really? really? No, it was just the most recent one. Was it? No, 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 no. It was longer. 2008? Yeah. It could have been 2008. No, 2010. No, it can't be right. 2010. Hmm. No, it's not. Yeah, it's, it's on the 2010. This song is on the 2010 compilation CD that is available now. Available that now. That one is? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Hello. Do it's I even know what's pretty old on? school for... <clears throat> I know, it's 2012, almost 2013. It's almost time for wow. a new compilation. Ooh, Are you kidding? It's time for like two more. We've missed a whole year. I know. I'm not sure how that happened. Is it publicly available? Has uh, released it uh, on CD Baby or any of iTunes or any of those other places. I'm not sure. It's almost time. Cultivator's like, what? Past time. I know. Yeah, we I, need, I need, we some... need two DVDs or two CDs to I make know. up. I know. 
<sighs> That's right. Okay, um, it's five minutes to ten o'clock here in San Francisco, California, and kids, I got to go to bed. Mm -hmm. Gotta go home. This is, I think the Devo Spice song was a, a wait, nice way to end Wait, wait, wait. It. Gotta go home. I gotta go home. Mm -hmm. Georgie, you can't tell where I am with these gray walls. I could be anywhere. <laughs> I, I know it's on the other side of the wall. Is your home? I know. <laughs> who, are you, who are you trying to tell this, this story this, to? This is this is just my little my little happy place. <laughs> oh, a minute of twist. It's almost time for coast to coast AM. You know what? I it is. I don't almost have radio time. Yet. I know, isn't it great? It's you can. Money. There you go. The Fump, ninety nine cents. You guys go support Devo Spice. He's pretty darn awesome. He has some great songs out there. He does he does all sorts of good um, nerdcore. Hey, did I ever did I ever read you my nerdcore raps? Mm -mm. Mm -hmm. You wrote nerdcore rap? Yeah, like one lyric, two lyrics. You can't read them. You gotta spit them. Gotta spit them out, right? There you go. So there was this Discovery International show that I was trying out for. And um, part of it was that we had to come up with a rap. Mm -hmm. And I was on a, bra on a team called the Brains, and the other team were the Brawns. And so we had to come up with, had to come up with uh, raps or some kind of rhyme or something. Mm -hmm. and it didn't just go rhymey for me. It just, it went, it went kind of hip hop so okay. or anyway nerd core here you come um our brains as big as the biggest big bang science is our middle name the lab is where we hang all of our plans will be well tested look out bronze you better be rested <laughs> nice so that was one that was one and then you're actually uh, uh, helping them because if they stay up late and cram they're actually going to do worse than if they just get a good night's sleep it was actually good advice. That's right. And then the other one was um, our brains are our muscles, so we bring the hustle. Scored a sixteen hundred on my SATs. We're the mother frackers that they want to be. <laughs> the mother frackers that they wow. want to be. <laughs> That's right. Scored a sixteen hundred on my SATs. We're the motherfuckers that they want to be. That's right. My my still my, my I, next I'm career. It's of, nerdcore. I'm very proud of my line from the the week I tried to wrap the disclaimer. That was a good. That was a good week. I like. It was that. okay. It was okay. I could have pulled it off a little better. But my favorite line from it was. Uh, from the Big Bang to the latest advances, we got more science news than Chinese zoos got pandas. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I like that one. <laughs> Still extra proud of that. It makes yeah. me giggle. Isn't that so? Twit Refugee is like 1600. That's a bad score today. Yeah, I, don't, I haven't taken the SAT in a long time. Yeah, now it's out of 2300. What the? Or, really? Yeah. Tw no. Really? Mm. Why? 2,400. 2,400. They added a, a third 800. Another category? Yeah. So it's like more hours of long? I, I don't know. You guys help me out in the chat room. It happened like two years after I was done. It didn't happen when... I, I Mine was at a 1,600 also, but it's... Oh, it is 2,300. So they added a third element, but I think it's maybe in place of the SAT2s, because you had to take SAT2s, right? I had to take the SAT too. Okay, so <laughs> when, no, I, I don't know when <laughs> I when were, back in my day, <laughs> they were just, just the SATs. They had the SATs, mm -hmm. but then in order to uh, apply to almost any school, yeah, I think maybe state schools you didn't, but almost any other school you had to at least take two SAT twos, which you could pick mm -hmm. a concentration. So I took mine in mm -hmm. in math and in. Science? Some sort of science. I forget. And then you had to do the writing SAT2s also. Mm -hmm. So you had the normal SATs and then you had to take two concentrations and then the writing portion of SAT2s. 
I don't I don't even remember the SATs. I just remember I showed up and I took them. I, I like took the a, ACTs. I didn't take the SAT. I took a the alternative uh, test. The alternative test. Yeah, the, the GED. <laughs> the one I took. Oh yeah, you can take ACTs instead. That's what someone's saying. In the that was the other option. Although a lot of the schools that I was applying to, they they kind of they were like ACTs. I don't think so. What if you did both? Well, you would just submit whichever you got a better score on, I guess. Or submit both of them if they're both good. Look, no, look, you have I, to I pick one. I tested twice. It's... You have to pick one. <laughs> you must choose. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I would like, a, I have a question for everyone out there. Um, I was going to give my flip camera to Blair. Old flip camera, but I can't find it anywhere. Mm -hmm. Cannot find it. I've been I've been tearing my house apart, and I can't. I find appreciate it. that. <laughs> but I I would like to send Blair off to Israel with a little camera, uh -huh. something similar to the flip. So, uh, do you guys have suggestions for something that I can get her? Oh, like that's to get very her nice. Oh, Kiki. I'm looking around. There there are a few different options. Something it's very something very simple. Shoot. Stick it in your computer. Yeah. yeah. Make it. Make it so. And Mac how about one of those cameras that are on a uh, on a phone? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like yeah. isn't that? But your much... iPhone. Yeah, I'm not sure if I'm gonna be able to take my iPhone. That's like the big hiccup. Wait, but you can still take it. Wait, and is it a newer use it one? As a camera? Yeah, I don't know how many. Like, okay. Hold, hold on, on a second. Hold to, on a second. Wait, 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 wait. Don't take them out. Don't take them out. Blair's gonna miss the whole thing. She doesn't. It. Okay, wait. She doesn't need to okay, do anything. I'm back. I have to put the headphones back in. Oh, her phone to... her phone will work. No, your phone will work there. What? Huh? What? Your phone huh? will work. It's like it's good enough for, for YouTube. I was worried it would be oh, bad yeah. looking. No, I don't mean I mean your phone yeah. will work for yeah. your phone will work. overseas. You just who's your carrier? Oh no no no. Okay. So if I were to go and just use my phone as it is overseas. Mm -hmm. I over six months, I would probably end up owing the phone company about ten to twenty thousand dollars. But over there, right? Not over here. <laughs> Wait, how does that work? What? <laughs> Every whenever you leave the country, then you're roaming, officially. Mm. But, so, but here's the thing. But here's the thing. Who's your provider? Oh yeah, maybe the iPod Touch. Wait, no, no. So Who's I have it? an iPod Touch which doesn't have a camera in it. Blair, li pay, listen up. Who's yes, it? yes, sir. Who, yes. <laughs> who provides your phone service? A T and T. You should call them. Yes. If you haven't already, tell them uh -huh. where you want to go and when yes. you want to go there. Yes. And see if did you already do this? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I Sprint get to pay an extra forty dollars a month, and then still pay. I think it's something like over three dollars a minute. What? Yeah. Well, that's because it's AT and T. Mhm, mm mhm, mm mhm. And they won't let me unlock it either. Because you're not. What? Yeah. They right. Won't. No, they won't. They they won't you let me unlock it until I will have owned the phone for two years. Mm -hmm. So right now I'm trying to. Um, do some illegal things and hack into the phone mm -hmm. because I can rent a mini SIM card for my iPhone mm -hmm. in Israel. Yeah. And they will even give me a local phone number so someone can call me from the United States and they don't have to pay anything to talk to me on the phone. And I will have incoming phone calls for free. So this is all a very wow. good deal. I just need to be able to put it into my phone. Right. Get rid of AT&T. Next time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What? So, anywho, that's where I'm at. Yeah. yeah jail I don't even know where my SIM card is. Oh, is that jailbreaking? Is, is Euchre saying it? Jailbreaking is not illegal. It, it's not illegal. Well, it's not illegal, phone, but, it, but it 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 voids my avoid the it voids agreement. my warranty. Yeah. So if I were to break my iPhone, then <clears throat> I can't get it fixed. But you couldn't get it fixed. Yeah. Exactly. So if I drop it in water or it shatters, I can't do anything. 
which is a bummer because I did pay for the <laughs> Apple Care because I was like, I drop my phones all the time. I should probably pay for this. But I didn't. I even got this phone with Israel in mind, which is why I was so upset that I couldn't it's not use it. Work. But I think that's where my SIM card is. I don't even know how to get it out. You could get. You could just use hammer. Yeah, if you if you could take the SIM card out, yeah. then you could use it like an iPod. That's touch. what I'm thinking. Yeah. So if nothing else, I can do that. You can just take. And then it out when I'm in a wireless do, network, I can still do stuff too. Yeah, you can do stuff like FaceTime, and you can do. Um, Skype, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. the all the voice over IP stuff. Okay, yeah, and I guess phone. the camera app on here is good enough to just record some video. That's going to be good enough resolution. Yeah. On the iPhone, yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, the iPhone's okay. got great resolution. It's probably better than a flip cam. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> I can just do that then. It would be good. Yeah, I'll figure it out. Yeah, that should be fine. This week, probably, I'm going to try to set up my blog. Yay, good. <laughs> Here it is. Foxbert says, just put it in airplane mode with Wi-Fi on. Ah, okay. Can you do that, maybe? Yeah. You I have a 4S. You just, you just have to make sure that it doesn't, yeah. Yeah. I have, I have an appointment with a friend on a Saturday who said that he might be able to jailbreak my phone, so. Yeah. We'll see. We'll see how well that goes. <laughs> Goldazator says landscape is better than portrait. Okay. For the that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Better to take the sim out. Yes. And then um, it can't possibly connect how... to the network. I agree yeah. with that. Yeah. yeah. But I don't know how to get my sim out. <laughs> it's like, I'm assuming it's right there. I have no idea. Wait, do you have one? A sim card? Yeah. If my brother it's a, would it's a micro around, sim. help, but... If you're in the Stockton area, Stockton, California, my brother does iPhone repair, so mm. he's not here. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> Use a paper clip. Oh, for that little tiny hole. All right. Yes. <laughs> I'm so Yeah, Christopher T. Search YouTube SIM card. Yeah, yeah wise. Videos. Wise. You, there's everything on YouTube. Because I did already buy for like a dollar on the internet a micro to normal SIM card adapter so that if I couldn't fix my issues I could put it in a normal phone for when I'm like at the airport and stuff mm -hmm. but if I'm just gonna take it anyway I can just do that too so I wasted a dollar but that's fine <laughs> that's okay paperclip in the hole on the SIM tray <laughs> says you <Huker. laughs> yeah there we go yeah that's gotta be it this has gotta be the SIM tray right there Ah, uh, go to your coast to coast AM minion of twists. Have yeah. a wonderful night. Um, it is now eight minutes after ten PM here in mm -hmm. San Francisco, mm -hmm. and um, I still need to go home and That's go to true. bed. <laughs> I'm already in bed. I believe that. Mm. Some somehow I do believe that. Really sure. Good gracious. Okay. Good night, everybody. Yeah. Good night, everyone. I had a really fun time tonight. Next week, tell your friends. Make sure you come. Don't miss it. It's Blair's last week here in the United States. It's true. It's the last week of we know that we have Blair yes. on the show. <laughs> yes. I'm really going to do all I can. It makes me so sad. Oh, gosh. I know. Uh, I mean, if nothing else, I'm going to have to at least like be in the chat room and watch. I'm going to yeah. have to wake up and do yeah. that. Even if yeah. I can't talk, I'm going to have to... And then, like, make strange statements about invertebrate sex. Yes. <laughs> yes. I know I'm going to be that person within 18 hours with all the new people that I meet. Yeah. I'm going to be that person. I just can't help it. I can't change who I am. No, and you shouldn't try to. <laughs> I hope not. Yeah. Um, tomorrow, no science chat. I'm, I'm off to a family wedding for the weekend, so... Yes, so no science chat tomorrow, but next Friday we'll be back on the regular schedule. And uh, everyone, good night, good night, good night. Thank you so much for joining us. And we'll see you again next week, I do hope. Time to click and broadcast. <laughs>